always want to say good morning uh, to everybody. Um, name of the service is it's, it's BKM, Blessed Kingdom Ministries, First Doctrine of Grace. And uh, I want uh, everybody to understand what we go by as um, our doctrine for our church. Uh, we've got several scriptures that we're going to go through, several scriptures that we're going to refer to, but we're not going to be here long. And um, but I just want to give you uh, access to what we do as a ministry, what we go by, because you don't just want to go to church. You want to go to a church that follows the proper doctrine that you um, that you adhere to. And so uh, we're going to talk a little bit from uh, use a scripture from John, from Genesis, from uh, uh, two scriptures from John, uh, actually three scriptures from John, one from Psalm and one from Romans and one from first Corinthians. And so uh, let me pray, Lord. Bless the hearers of this word and the doers of this word and the receivers of this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we spoke about uh, the work of transformation, because uh, if you are in here and you are under the teaching of the Holy Spirit, you, must, you, you will be transformed by the word of God. And we established that the, you know, our, what foundation uh, we have for spiritual growth. If you want to spiritually grow, you have to be spiritually obedient. You can't just go to church one time and expect to grow. Growth happens through obedience. And if you want to see the face of God, how many in here want to see the face of God? Anybody want to see God's presence in their lives? Well, if you want to see the presence of God in your life, you have to do the things of God. And a person's growth, like we talked about last week, is always in alignment with the person's obedience. That being said, you have to know the church's doctrine. You have to know what we're about as a ministry so that you can understand that you're under sound doctrine or you're under unsound doctrine. And so um, you want to know what the foundational beliefs is for Blessed Kingdom Ministries and what we go by. So over the, over the next few weeks, uh, we are going to go over the doctrine for this church because there are different beliefs and uh, a church's doctrine is real important. Jesus said, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, there will be many who call him Lord who do not know him. And so he was talking about church people. And so uh, it's important that we know the foundation of the church that you're at. If this is your first time or if you've been here for a while, you want to know the doctrine of the church. Uh, before becoming a part of a church, you want to know the doctrine of the church because it matters. It matters what the church is teaching because not everybody who calls him Lord will know him. Not all ch churches make Jesus Christ Lord. And so uh, it's important that we, you know the doctrine. And another important fact about knowing the doctrine um, is it should always align with the word of God. It should always align with scripture. Uh, if I came in here and said, I, I want everybody to speak in tongues and I want everybody to raise the dead. It's your duty to establish whether that's truth according to the scripture or not. And if it's not, then I, you should flee away from that, that, that teaching because that teaching is not of God. So it's important that we understand it's our duty as the vessels that God uses to take in and understand his doctrine, understand what he wants for our lives and understand what true salvation is. Um, we don't want to make something that's or take in something that's not true as our official doctrine. We don't want to take that in because that's what they call religion. That's not relationship. And we're here for a relationship with God. I know y'all didn't come because y'all heard a great speaker was going to be here. You came to receive the word of God. Can I get an amen this morning? So over the next few weeks, we're going to go over the doctrine that Blessed Kingdom Ministries goes by. And I'm going to give you a scripture that lines up with what we talk about with our doctrine. So make sure you take notes, make sure uh, you don't, you, you hear the scriptures, but you also study the scriptures for yourself. Don't just come to church. We want you to be a church. We want you to change. There has to be evidence of change in your life. If you're going to church, you have to receive something from the word of God. Amen. And so our foundation as Blessed Kingdom Ministries, our foundation is based on what we call the five doctrines of grace. This is not 
It's not something that that's new. It's it's scripturally sound. And so we're going to go over those doctrines. And the first doctrine we're going to talk about today um, is going to give you understanding of who you are and where you are and why you are here. We believe that the Bible clearly explains, clearly explains and, and, get, and, and tells us that salvation is a result of God's grace, not man's abilities. Amen. So we're, we're, we're going to go over that. And we want to make sure you understand that John, the first scripture we're going over is John 1, verse 12 and 13. This is what Jesus said. John 1, verses 12 and 13, it says, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children not born of natural descent, nor a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. That's what John says in the scripture. And so what does that tell you? You can't save yourself. I can't save you. You can't save yourself. It's a gift from God, not man's decision. It's God's grace. So let me read that again. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of what? Natural descent, nor a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. And so that means we have nothing to boast about. I don't have anything to boast about because I'm a pastor. You don't have anything to boast about because you're a member of a church or because you serve God. The only glory that anything or anybody gets is God. God gets the glory because he saved us. We didn't save ourselves. We are incapable of saving ourselves. Now, the first doctrine of grace that we're going over this morning helps us to understand the state of man, uh, the state that we are at without God which is what we call a depraved state, depraved, a depraved state. The word depraved, it means morally corrupt. It means wicked. And so you may say something, you may have come in here and say, well, I'm a good guy. I do good things, or I'm a good gal, or I, I, I follow the doctor. I follow God. I do this. I do that. I go to church. I, well, so did the Pharisees. The Pharisees went to church. Jesus's fight wasn't with the people of the world. It was with the people of the church. And so when we understand that strength, when we understand that understanding, when we understand those things, we understand that it doesn't matter whether you think you're a good guy. It matters what God thinks about us. And so in this world, we may be good people. We may consider us ourselves good people comparing ourselves to the world. But before a righteous God, who is perfect in everything that he does, we are considered wicked before him. And there is a reason why that is that, that he considers us that way. And so it's explained in Genesis 3, verse 6, where why we became wicked. When, and I want you to understand this. When God created the first man and woman, he gave them specific guidelines what they could and what they could not do. He told them not to eat of a specific tree. Y'all know that uh, when it talks about Adam and Eve, everybody has heard that scripture before, but he gave them directions not to eat from a specific tree. And some might say, well, why did he tell them, uh, you know, uh, not to eat from a specific tree? How many people have questioned God before? Anybody, anybody other than me who questioned God before? The, why did he tell us to do this? Why did he tell us to do that? Some may say that. Some may say, why does, why does he tell them not to eat of a specific tree, but yet put the tree in front of them? And I would say, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. God explains that, but it doesn't matter why he does what he does. How many people are old school? I know that when I was young, uh, my parents would tell us, do not go in our room when we are not home. Anybody ever heard that before? When I'm not home, do not go in my room. We didn't address that by saying, well, why? Why not? Why, why would we not address that by saying why? Old school people know exactly why uh, that response would not come. Because if you asked your parents why, they would say, because I said so. And I see some old school folks in here already. Because I said so, millennial folks are a little different. Millennial parents are, will provide an explanation. Well, it's because of, I don't, I have this and I have that in my room and I don't want you to, yeah. But old school parents would just give you a specific directive. Do not go in my room. 
because they are the authoritative figure and what they say goes, right? And so let me just say that God doesn't have to explain to our uh, selves, to our, us, why he does what he does. He just simply does it. He says what he says, and we are to follow it or we are to deny it. It is up to us. And so he can do what he wants. He can do it when he wants, and he can do it how he wants, because he wants. We got some old school folks in the back laughing about old school stuff. I know. We're going to talk about it afterwards. Amen. <laughs> amen. 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 So he told us not to do something. That's all we need to know. God said, don't do it. And he can say whatever he wants to, but he said that. And then he explains it to us like he has to. He doesn't have to explain to us what happened in the beginning, but he does. And the serpent, also known as the devil, tempted those who were created. And they did not, they listened to the, the serpent rather than to the creator. And this explains why uh, this, uh, what decision we made in Genesis 3, verse 6. It says, when the woman saw the fruit, of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Simple stuff. So because we decided to listen to something other than God, that moment forward, we became morally corrupted. It's really that simple. You don't have to figure out all the details. You just know that you did something that God told you not to. And because of that, we became morally corrupted. And what does that mean? Our very nature is corrupted. Our thought process is corrupted. You know, think about it. We're talking about our parents, you know, and we know our parents are an authoritative figure. And we look at the kids of today and how they say, well, why can't I go outside? You don't, and when I tell you to go outside, you don't say, why can't I go outside? You say, why can't I go outside? Because it goes against who you want, uh, who you are and what you want. So, our very nature is to reject authority. And our mind, our will, our emotions naturally reject God. That's what we do. We don't even know, we didn't even seek God. And if we just based it on, you know, like Elder Medina always uses the commandments. I love how he uses the commandments when he talks to people about the Lord. And so, if we just based it on that, on the commandments, how many of us have naturally told a lie before? How many told a lie, raised a hand? Those not raising a hand, told a lie before. If the, not raising a hand, told a lie today. <laughs> hey Amen. Someone put up two hands and a foot. <laughs> and so how many people have, have uh, stolen something before? Everybody raised their hand. Those who didn't are lying. You stole a pencil, a pen, or whatever. It doesn't matter, but you stole something before. How many people have cheated on a test before? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Couple. I never got caught, though. But anyways, um, I mean, just all kind of things that we do. Uh, sensitive sex, sensitive uh, stories. Uh, uh, how many people have looked at somebody inappropriately? Sex outside of marriage. All those things. Uh, cursed God before? Uh, how many people have cursed God before? Say, say amen if you've done that. How many people have said OMG before? Amen. There you go. How many people have, have had anger before? How many people have been jealous before? How many people have had envy before? How many people have, have murdered before? Don't raise your hand, please. But, okay, good question. Abortion. Oh, can we get an amen this morning? Hmm. I've never murdered somebody. Well, yeah, maybe I have. Hmm. Good question. Again, our very nature is corrupted. We think it's okay to abort because it doesn't fit what we're, what we're trying to do. We think it's okay to lie. We think it's okay to be jealous, to be angry. We think it's okay to shack up. Get what I'm saying? See, uh, everybody's quiet today. It's like, dang, I'm, I'm guilty. We're all guilty because we naturally reject God. And we have to understand that. We naturally reject God. And again, our very nature is corrupted. Don't try to figure yourself out. Just know that you're corrupted. Pastor said, I'm corrupted. That's true. We're all corrupted. 
We will not seek God without God's help. It's impossible because we naturally want to do those things. And here's more scriptures I want to, to support what we're talking about, to support this truth, John 3, verse 19 and 20. This is what, what, what's being said. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. They're talking about Jesus. But people love darkness. Guess what? Guess who they're talking about? People, us. Instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. We talked about a, a five to 10 things and everybody was like, ooh, yeah, that's me. Ooh, that's me. And some were multiple offenders. But the fact is, we don't want to be exposed. We don't want to be exposed for sin. And here's what this is saying, that without Jesus, we naturally love sin because we were born into it. It's okay to, yeah, and when you're born, you, you think it's okay to fight. And babies, what do babies do? Babies fight for rattles. That's my rattle. Man. They fight for bottles. They fight for food. They'll fight another baby. Even they don't, they don't know the baby's name. They'll scratch them. I'm just talking about my family. Any of your families do that? And so we typically turn away from God. That is natural. That is natural in our flesh. Psalm 51, verse 1 through 5, this is a psalm of David when he's pleading with God for forgiveness. This is what he says. Let me read this to you. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from sin, from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justify when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. What is that telling you? You are born into it. You naturally have it. That's why some of you come in here and think, well, I don't know if I about this God thing. We all said that. Why? Because we naturally will reject God. Even if we grew up with God in our family, maybe we were Catholic or whatever, or Baptist or whatever you grew up in, when you got old enough, what did you do? Reject God. Why? Because you naturally reject him. And so we have to understand why we do what we do. And so without Jesus, we are naturally what they call corrupt and naturally what you, what you attract to, you are a slave to. So if you attract to sin, you are a slave to what? Sin, naturally. And we have no permanent place with God without God. And so looking at what has happened you know, look, you know, looking at what's happening across this world, like with Ukraine and Russia, how do we know, you know, uh, why do we always pursue godlessness? Why do we always do crazy things? Well, without God, we always pursue what is not God. People say, well, why, why is Putin so evil? And why is this? And why is that? And why is Ukraine this way? And why, why is everybody so angry? And why is everybody fighting? And what, is this going to be a world war? And somebody should bomb them or somebody bomb them? Look, we're all thinking godlessness. Why? It's because we naturally think that way. We blame them, but in our sight, we're doing the same thing. Putin's a bad man, but I'll abort my child. And so Romans 1, verse 18 and 19, explains what's going on. Why Putin doesn't know Jesus. Why some, some who are in this world, a lot who are in this world do not know Jesus. What's going on? This is what it says in verse 18. Romans 1, uh, for Romans 1 verse 18 and 19. It says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of who? People who suppress the truth by what? Their wickedness. 
since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. What does that mean? <laughs> the simplicity of this is, is, is really this. Even in our sinful nature, we know there's a God. We, we can avoid him all, all, all we want to, but we know he exists. We can say, I don't believe in that God thing, but you, you wake up and breathe the same air he gives you. you see? see, we all say that, but we know he's real. And it says here that, the, you know, that even in our sinful selves, we know that God is real and he gives us over to what? Our sins. And so we know God is real, but for our sake, we hope that he isn't real. That's what I'm talking about. See, in, in, in our sins, we don't want to see God. We don't want to think about what we've done. We don't want to think about the, the bad things we've done. We want to blame everybody else, but not blame ourselves. And so in our sinful natures, we try to avoid God. We try to stay away from him. We try to, re we try to reject everything that calls itself God. And we make that our, uh, something we are against. We try to reject him because of the sin that is in our hearts and our lives. And so 1 Corinthians 2.14, that's another scripture. The person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit, but considers them foolishness. Isn't that an amen this morning? Amen. Let me read that again. The person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are, uh, they are discerned only through the spirit. Wow. So you cannot understand God, but by the grace of God. Why is that? Because without God, you are corrupted by default. It is impossible to be here wanting to praise God without God helping you. And so that, that's what makes me excited about what we do here. We tell people about Jesus, and if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's because God wanted you to know his son. That's exciting. That's not, that's not based on all the things you're going through in your life. That's based on the gift of God. So moral corruption is a fact. We naturally will reject God. And it doesn't mean that none of us has ever done an act of kindness because it's not moral corruptness is not based on what we've done in this world. I've given a thousand dollars here and I'm taking care of that person and I fed that person on the corner. And that's not what, what, what we're referring to when we talk about moral corruptness. Because you do acts of kindness doesn't mean you're not morally corrupt. All acts of kindness should be for the glory of God, not the glory of self. And so though you may help people and though you may do something for somebody, if it's not for the glory of God, it's still acting in that moral corruptness that we naturally have. Well, I've given a million dollars to the church, but for who? For your tax break or for the glory of God? I just wanted to help the church. No, you wanted to write that off. See, there's a difference between just acts of kindness and the glory of God. And as we learn this special grace that God gives us, we realize that none of us have bragging rights. I don't have the right to say, oh, thank God I finally accepted Jesus. I don't have the right to say, you're going to this place or you're going to that place. I don't have the right to condemn or convict anybody else of what God has saved me from. It was his grace that I have been saved. So when I go out and tell people about the Lord, I tell people about the Lord, not with condemnation, but with the glory of God, because what he has done for my life, all of us, every one of us in here falls short without God. Do you understand that? Everybody understand that? None of us would have looked at God without God. None of us can save ourselves without God. Why is that important? Because 2,000 years ago, God's son came down to this earth to fulfill a plan that the father had for eternity. And all the evidence is here today in what, uh, for those who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord. 
If you believed in Jesus Christ, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you have accepted him as Lord, you have been saved by the grace of God. Amen. And so when you know that evidence, when you know that you're saved by grace alone, when you know that your belief in Jesus was a work that God has done in you, it talks about it in, in the book of John that nobody can come to the father unless the father or nobody can come to the son unless the father draws him. It's a work of God, grace of God, blessing of God. This church is a blessing of God. It's not our efforts, it's the efforts of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And when you understand what Jesus has done for us, you will find that as we go over the doctrines, as we go over these doctrines of grace for this ministry, you were not a mistake. None of you. Some of you may be going through something. Some of you may be dealing with something in your heart, dealing with something in your lives, but you have to know that you were not a mistake because it wasn't all for your efforts. It was all the efforts of God. God has blessed you to know his son as Jesus Christ as Lord. It's a gift. It's a free gift that God gave to you. The fact that you're here Looking for something from God is evidence that God has saved you. Can you stand to your feet and give God a round of applause in the house of the Lord? Don't be bashful. Give him a round of applause in the house of the Lord. Amen. You were made in the image and likeness of God before you were created on this earth. There was a plan for you. You were incapable of accepting God, but God was capable of accepting you. He had a plan for you before you had a plan for yourself. And for that purpose alone, you understand that you are here because God wanted you to be here. Children, young adults, adults, older adults, know that God has a plan for your life. Know that he has a purpose for you. Know that in, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you have been through, God has a plan for you because he chose you before you were in your mother's womb. Eternal life is a gift and you are blessed with that gift because God wanted you to have eternal life. You didn't trip up into eternal life. You were blessed with eternal life. And this is not by circumstance. Do you understand that? You were saved by the grace of God. Some of you are worried about your finances. Some of you are worried about your, your children. Some of you are worried about your next meal. Some of you are worried about the, your, 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 your vehicle. Some of you are worried about your house. Some of you are worried about your payments. But God has saved you and given you eternal life. That means that you will be out of the body, present with the Lord. Can you give God a round of applause in the house of the Lord? Do you understand what he has done for you on that cross? People who are not to know God, people who will not know him just will not know him. That's why they think what you do is foolishness. Because Satan blinds the minds of who? non-believers but God said not you not you not you God has opened all of our eyes do you know what this means this means that when Jesus died on the cross he didn't just die on the cross thinking that you might accept him he was dying on the cross thinking of you in specific. That he didn't die on the cross wondering, well, there might be somebody named Larry uh, 2,000 years later who might know me. He died on the cross thinking of Larry. He died on the cross thinking of Shannon. He died on the cross thinking of Cindy. He died on the cross thinking of Renelda. He died on the cross thinking of Theo. He died on the cross thinking of James. He died on the cross thinking of all of us. Do you understand what he's done for us? 
He knew your name. When he got nailed, he knew your name. That's why every breath should be praising the Lord. We get caught up in all of our other stuff. But God saved you. And he knew your name on that cross. Some of you watched the passion of Christ and cried because you know the pain he's going, he's going through and all that stuff and all that sacrifice. But now you can watch it knowing that on that cross, he knew your name. What is that? That's a whole different type of praise. It's a whole different type of worship. I don't just say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I say, thank you, Jesus, for knowing me. We stand here in submission to who he is and what he has done for us. We, we say, thank you, Jesus, for your blood, not just shed for Christians, but shed for me. That time he spent about to give his life on that cross, he was thinking of us. That's why it doesn't bother me to work and do the works of God. That's why it doesn't bother me to tell others about Jesus because I'm operating in grace. We are doing the work of God. God knew you and saved you. You didn't trip up into salvation. You were blessed with it before you were created on this earth. And for that alone, you should praise God. For that alone, we should say, thank you for your blood, Lord. For that alone, you should get on your knees by yourself and just cry out to God. For that alone, you should worship him and, and just look at the, the meals that are in a place you're eating and bless all the meals because you know that God had a special anointing for your life. You are special, not because I said you're special. You're special because you know Jesus as Lord and as Savior. You're special because you showed up today. You're special because the blood of Jesus saved your lives. You're special because he knew you before you were created on this earth. Ephesians 1.4 says that God chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, in his sight. He predestined us to know him. And if that don't make you stand, I don't know what will. If that don't make you wanna shout Jesus to the rooftops, I don't know what will. If that don't make you wanna get up and come to church, I don't know what will. If that don't make you want to tell somebody in the streets, hey, this is, this is Jesus. Well, I know Jesus as Lord and as Savior. If that don't help you want to help somebody, want to take care of somebody in the name of God, I don't know what will. If that don't help you want to pray for others, I don't know what will. And that's what we do. That's why we serve God. That's why we don't worry and stress about everything that happens in this church, because we know that we're serving God. We're, we're operating under the grace of God. Every mortgage payment that's made is made in the name of Jesus. Every person we feed on the streets is fed in the name of Jesus. We don't brag about it because we're doing the, the work of God. We know that we, can, we, we, we are blessed by the, the blood of Jesus, not anything else. There's nothing we've done. We're morally corrupt without God. We naturally reject him without, without him. Without his help in our lives, we wouldn't know him. So you have to be ready, family. You have to be ready to give an account of who we are and why we know this gospel and why we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's what we're about as a ministry. That's one of the doctrines of grace. We will tell you the rest of them as we go through these weeks because we're not about just, 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 just coming here and saying church. We're about being church. 
We want you to be, to learn something, to learn the word of God, to understand why you need to be here. It's not based on me. It's based on God. God's glory flows in this atmosphere. Healing flows in this atmosphere. Restoration flows in this atmosphere. Sanctification, glorification flows in this atmosphere. Not because of me, but because of the glory of God. And you have to know that all these things you receive because you know Jesus is Lord. And so um, I pray for you. We're going to go over these doctrines and we'll go over them uh, uh, next week. We'll, dis we'll discuss uh, why God unconditionally saves us, and why he has mercy on us. And, uh, you know, you want to sign up for the course of not trying to figure it all out, but just trusting him as Lord, knowing that if you know him, uh, you know, if you're worried about the person who does not know God, maybe you need to minister to that person. Maybe you need to be the example to that person. Maybe you need to show them the glory that God has on your life, the favor that he's given you. That will turn people around. But if we operate in the world, if we operate as a corrupted person, if we're still out there cursing and, and swearing and, and talking about people, if we're still uh, operating in anger and fear and doubt and resentment and all those things, we're still operating in, in frustration and, and not being fascinated by, fascinated by the glory of God. You have to turn away from God to be frustrated. Because frustration is not in the Lord. You have to turn away to be angry. Because he says it's okay to be angry about the word, about the things of God, but not in the world. Don't be angry. He says, be angry, but sin not. So you have to be ready to give an account of why we do what we do, family. And next week, we will discuss that. Have you been blessed in the house of the Lord this morning? If you've been blessed, give God a round of applause in the house of the Lord. Stand to your feet so we can pray for you this morning. Lord, we ask that you bless this family. Bless them, take care of them. Uh, allow them to know you as God. Allow them to be obedient in serving you and knowing you as righteousness. The, we thank you, Father, for the favor and the mercy in their hearts and their lives. Show them, Father. Show them that you are with us and that you are with them, Father. Show them that you will never leave them. Give them a comforted heart. There are some people in here who may have lost somebody. There are some people in here who may have experienced some, some challenges and some trials. But Lord, uh, let them know that you have always been with them and you'll never leave them. And you're the one that gives them security and you're the one that gives them strength. We pray for the blessing and the mercy of God upon all this congregation. We give you all the honor and all the glory in the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And if you agree, let's say it all together. Amen.